With no further ado, here we have Mr. Sean Finter. Please welcome him. All right. All right. Sure. All right. Thank you, Frankie. I've got, I've got this one here, I think. Oh. All right. Can you guys hear me all right? Good. Well, I am uh, really excited to be here. This is my first time back to Berlin since I was a 20-year-old backpacker. Uh, very different view of the city uh, this time around. Um, came over with... Diageo, uh, world-class judge, and there, and then I get to be here with you guys today and go home tomorrow after eight days, so it's been an amazing week. Um, I have prepared some, some ideas for you guys, and uh, before I get started, just make sure that's working. Before I get started, I just wanted to find out who's in the room here so I can kind of tailor the, the talk a little bit. How many people in this room own a bar or restaurant? Wow, okay, quite a few. Okay, and then bartenders? A bar in the future? I'll talk you out of that. I got 55 minutes to talk you out of that. So, guys, I'm going to tell you, I figured out who was in the room. Uh, you're probably wondering who the hell is this guy, for those of you that haven't heard, uh, heard from me before. Um, my quick backstory is I, I bartended for uh, about six years uh, full time. I left. Uh, Toronto, uh, from a little town in Canada, just north of Toronto when I was a kid. Um, I worked at Hard Rock Cafe in, uh, in Toronto, back when it was still cool to work at Hard Rock. You remember those days? No? Uh, I got an opportunity to go to London, and it totally changed my life. Um, from London, being based in London, I used to work three, four, six months at a time, uh, earn sterling, Back then, a 100-pound note was like a gold bar, you know, and take money, go, and I travel through, um, went around Europe, uh, a little bit into Latin America, do it along the way. Um, I became a, I had a short stint in management. I really only managed for about two years, um, and I worked for a consulting firm, and these are just, as a restaurant owner, I owned restaurants for six years. I fell in love with the place and decided that I wanted to make that home. And um, I bought my first restaurant uh, for a dollar and about $800,000 worth of debt. So I kind of took over a business from somebody else. Um, the business had been bankrupt six times in eight years. So I had that new management sign in the window over and over again. Um, at that time, you know, my goals were almost entirely ego-driven. So I wanted to have a $30 million company by the time I was 30. I did not accomplish that, um, but when I sold my uh, business, when I was 33 years old, uh, we were a $32 million company. Uh, as a 26-year-old and all the way through, I was like the old guy on the team. So we did it with 19-year-olds and 21 and 22-year-olds. So some of the systems I'm going to show you today will seem very simplistic, and they're meant to be. And they connected a remarkable group of people together to accomplish some things that a lot of people didn't think we could do. Um, at the age of, of 33, uh, for a kid who grew up without a lot of money, I had money. I was bought out for uh, multiple. And um, I was quite unsatisfied in my life. I was uh, 275 pounds. Um, I had come out of working 80 or 90 hours a week and wearing it like a badge of honor. I, I put a lot of stress and grind on my relationships with my family and friends primarily because I just wasn't present. Even when I was off, I was off somewhere else in my mind or just totally exhausted. The first year I opened my first restaurant, uh, Red Bull was introduced in Australia. That nearly killed me. Uh, I drank six or eight cans of that a day and another six cups of coffee. So a lot of the work I do today is about, yes, helping uh, bar and restaurant operators uh, make more money and, and do better, but it's all driven from a place of wellness. You know, I really believe that if you get healthy yourself, your business becomes healthy as a byproduct, and I'll, and I'll show you how. So my gap year, I was going to take a year off. Um, I started Barmetrics, and it was like a free uh, service initially. I wanted to help 10 other bar and restaurant operators. And I found 10 pretty quickly. Uh, it was disassembled when the acquisition went through. And I got them back together uh, for lunch up in Manly, and I said, I think this could be a business, you know, in helping bar and restaurant operators. And um, I, I wouldn't say they looked to talk me out of it, but they weren't overly enthusiastic. There weren't a lot of examples of small businesses starting in this field. Uh, it's tough to get paid when you help distressed businesses as well. Um, 
So we got going. Uh, Barmetrics launched in 2000, and we had 80 clients in 18 months. Um, and as Frankie mentioned, we just opened our 22nd office. So we're in eight countries now. And it, it just still feels like a dream, you know, like just being in the line of work and helping people. And, and uh, now we flipped to a, a franchise model and a license model because I hit a point where I, I've only been to 16 of those offices. And, and I'd like to get to them all and I will get to them all. But I'm just not the type that can own a business with thousands of employees and not know people. So we, we changed our model up. Um, second thing is uh, I've written two books that have never been printed. Uh, two of them turned into courses. Uh, Angus and I worked on uh, Green Room together, which we toured the U.S. for a couple of years, which was awesome, one of the most fun times I've ever had. And then I wrote a book, the working title was Business of Bars, and the Diageo team liked it, and we turned it into a video course. So it's offered around the world, and uh, I'm looking to print a hard copy version of, of one of the uh, one of the courses, which is called Napkinomics, we'll touch, touch on a little bit today. Um, this has been the most satisfying project I've ever worked on. This is an old house in uh, the small town I live in, in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, I bought this house because I had been tortured for about 10 years in windowless boardrooms. I cannot stand rooms without natural light. And I'm invited to all these strategy meetings, and I wanted to have a house where People could connect and celebrate and plan and strategize. I wanted to build bars into it. So I've just, I bought it a few years ago, but I just really opened it to the, to the industry this year. And one of the things that I, that I do there, one of the projects inside of there, is I coach. Uh, I coach a group of about 40 entrepreneurs. Uh, Kostin's here, he flies in from Bucharest. We have people that fly in from Australia, uh, UK, Canadians, uh, and a lot of Americans, of course. Um, Gary, one of my favorite guys in the group. Allison Bybee, uh, last presentation, they were talking about Sed Moses. There's Sed, awesome guy. We lost one of our most beloved members in, in John this year. Um, so these guys here have really uh, brought me back to life. You know, this is, honestly, it's been better for me than owning bars. I get that itch every year still to go back to it, and now I get to work with these guys and work on their ideas and their dreams and work where I'm, where I'm good in business, which is a pretty small, uh, small vertical. So, uh, oh, this is us having, having some fun. Uh, that's part of my management team. This is the mayor of Annapolis. This is why I'm not allowed back at City Hall. They say you're not allowed to accost the mayor after I've already been uh, warned about pounding the gavel for another great photo. Uh, he's a great guy, a friend that we got elected. So you want to change things, you get your mates elected. Our guest bartenders uh, unmask themselves after their first drink, so you never know who's coming into town. It's always fun. We just installed this. It's an exact replica of John's sign from, uh, from his Miami property. So I want to start off you know, a little bit with the, the strategy and what, what these folks do that a lot of others don't. Um, and I know I hear their, their Competitors say, like, you know, they've got an unfair competitive advantage. Like, what are they doing differently than others? One of the things that I say to all the folks when they start working with us is that I, I don't value starving artists. I don't. And there's a lot of starving artists in this industry. Um, last night alone, I had three people come up to me that won top 50 bars in London, and I won't mention who, that are not making any money. In fact, they're bleeding money for their, for their art. I just doesn't, I don't think it needs to be that way. I don't. If you're going to have a business that's not for profit like Bobby does, do that. If you have a for-profit business, I really think you have an obligation to make money. Unless your staff have all got health care, they've all got new shoes, they're doing great, they've got all the time off they want, you're doing things in your community, don't be broke, right? Figure out how to make money in business. Um, so here's just a few things off the top when I look at a new business. Um, top businesses in the world that make good money lose only one to 3% of their product. Typically, 1% of their liquids, 3% of their food. So if you're losing five or 10 or 20% of any of those, it's a massive missed opportunity. It's really tough to compete with somebody that locks down their business and just accounts for everything and don't, don't have those losses. It's like trying to win a yacht's race when you have a leaky boat. It's really tough to win. Um, they also have single digit voluntary turnover with their staff. Now, we encourage our team to kind of measure uh, 
turnover as such, and then voluntary, right? So if you let people go or move them on, sometimes that's very different than, than folks choosing to lose or choosing to leave. And thirdly, they maximize the discretional effort of all their team. And what I mean by that is all of us have been in great bars before, right? And I think we've all been in bars before that if the owner or the GM's in the room, you get different service than you do if they're not. Right, so great bars are, are really aligned with the people they work with, and those staff members really embody that brand. They, they treat it like their own. Right, the word, even the word corporation comes from the Latin root, means the body, so that a single person embodies that experience. So if your staff are, are stepping up and living your brand and treating it like it's their own business, then you're in this group here, which I think is uh, where you want to be. Um, so just going back to to uh, when I was 26 years old. My first mentor in, in Sydney, a gentleman named Stuart Lloyd, I told him I was gonna get started, I was gonna buy this place with 800 grand worth of debt attached to it. And he said, what's your plan? You know, how are you gonna win? How are you gonna rig the game? And I said, what does that mean? And he drew this out for me on a, on a piece of paper. He said, if you do these four things, if you have a plan, and I don't mean that bullshit 30 pager that lives in your drawer that no one's ever seen before, I mean an active working plan that your entire team knows what's up and what you're striving for. Secondly, if you have a coach or a consultant, you know, he said to me, listen man, intelligence and especially specialty needs is cheap. It's a lot cheaper to hire someone to, to get you across the line and get you momentum, then you own that knowledge and then you move to the next person, you move through. Thirdly, uh, he encouraged me to get a board um, and a mentor. That was a game changer for me. How many people in the room either have a board or a mentor or both? How many people? Okay, that is free, by the way. I've never paid a board member before. Um, one of my board members, for example, in, in DC, uh, also advises Mark Zuckerberg. I pay him nothing. He likes me, values me, and I value him. And I hounded him for two and a half years. Um, I've had over 100 board members over the last 15, 16 years and it's a game changer, and as I say, it's free. So if you want to know more about that, I'm going to put my email up, and I'm encouraging all you guys to at least have a mentor, you know, someone who's done what you want to do, and they're on their way back, and they just want so desperately to share it with somebody, right? They've, they've acquired all this knowledge, and they have all this passion, and they want to invest it in someone who's going to do something with it. And then finally, a peer group. Uh, my entire career, I've been uh, a member of two groups every year. Uh, so this year, I'm still a member of Entrepreneurs Organization, where I sit on the board. And secondly, I'm in a group called Black Belt that has nothing to do with martial arts. I don't think it's a great name, um, but it's on coaching and it teaches me to be, I have a coach for coaching. So being a part of a peer group is another way to really get, you know, EO costs me, I don't know what it is, 6,000 bucks a year and I get $100,000 value every year. And my other group costs me, whatever it is, 20 grand a year and I get hundreds of thousands of dollars of value. So again, you can purchase that and be aligned with people that are, are like-minded. Um, this is uh, one of the things we do with our group here, and, and I wanted to share with you, this is a one-page business plan that all of our members that, that come in, this is uh, Alex and Dave from Death & Co, and they have their entire initiative for 100 days on a plan, right? We produce it over the course of half a day, they refine it on the, on the last day that they're with us. They come into town every 100 days. Kostin does the same. And on here, you know, you set up your goals, your KPIs. How are you going to activate, calibrate, accelerate, and then celebrate that? Who's going to help you with it? Here's the fun stuff like the theme and the celebration and so forth. If you take nothing away from today, I'll send you guys all this. Anyone who wants it, I'll give it to you. You take nothing away from today. Like, you can change your business just doing one major initiative every four months, right? And get your staff to help you. I did all of this with my bartenders and bar backs and servers and line cooks, right? You don't need consultants to come in to, to work on your business. Okay, so we have, how much time do we have left? I've got, I got a lot. We got 45 minutes left and I wanna leave uh, enough time at the end for Q&A, but please don't wait to the end. If you, uh, you wanna hear something, you have a question, um, put your hand up. Oh, and we have a mic there. I thought Frankie had our first question. I thought that's convenient. You've got the mic already. Yeah? 
All right, so I'm going to give you guys a, a few big ideas, and I picked a few that have never failed where the entrepreneur or the manager poured themselves into it and made it work, right? I guarantee you these things will work in your business. Uh, your job today is to, to pick one of those ideas, and it's, you know, I get emails from people after doing these things that say, hey, I was working on like 17 things that you said, and none of them are working. This is because you're working on 17 things, right? So pick one thing from today, like a buffet. Don't take all the shrimp. So here are some of these, uh, these differences that I find with um, some entrepreneurs that are, that are really outperforming the market. Firstly, they have a highly, an unusually high transparency. So who's heard of the term open book management? Anyone heard of that term? Okay. I, I discovered open book management as an accident. I had a, a property, uh, a bar in Sydney that was, you know, I thought I had the Midas touch until, until you don't, right? Then you have a property that's just not clicking. It's not working. And it wasn't losing money, but it was on the cusp. And I went to my team, you know, we were only nine months in. And, you know, my model in, in business was like 15% net profit was a minimum. Like that's, you take a lot of risk as an owner. Um, so I wanted to make sure that all my businesses were performing at that level or above. And this place was sitting around 5%. And so I went to my team and I said, guys, you know, something's not working and we've looked at the numbers and our targets and what's happening on the floor. And um, they were all surprised at how little we were making because I told them for the first time. Before then, I management saw the numbers. So I said, just out of curiosity, I asked them two questions. They had, we had coasters on the table. And I said, right on the coaster, total revenue for this property. This is all the staff. So there's about 45 people in the room. I said, right, total revenue. And just take a wild guess at how much money this business makes. So at the time, that business was doing around $2 million and making 5%. And they wrote on the coaster, the average was around 3.5 million and around 15 or 20%. Right, so staff have a very different perspective of your business because most of them are only there when it's really busy. And they see a lot of money going into the registers and they know that you know, a bottle of beer costs a dollar but you're selling it for five. There's not a huge amount of financial literacy taught in our industry. And when I showed them the actual numbers, um, they were surprised. And I decided that at that property, I was just gonna keep the numbers up. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep showing them what's happening. And I said, we gotta bring this around. This is the quickest turnaround I've ever had in one of my own businesses because people understood, and we understood what the levers were and the different mechanisms. So, it made me think at the time that, you know, I just assumed that everybody understood, everybody was financially literate. I became financially literate before I was literally literate. I learned to read a P&L and a balance sheet before I learned to read a book. So I learned to read at uh, an adult level when I was 21 years old. I grew up uh, with a severe type of dyslexia. Uh, I thought I was just French Canadian, or my mother is. And uh, that's what the teachers told me, you know, taking me out of classes and saying, hey, you gotta stop, you know, uh, bilingual school. And then when I went out of that, uh, it didn't get any better. So I started at a, at a restaurant when I was uh, 12, almost 13 years old, just before my birthday little truck stop in my, in my town. And the guy that owned it, his name was, was Mr. Panu, uh, a guy who changed, changed my life. He offered me the job after a very lengthy interview process, and I won't even get into that, a, a two-week interview process for a dishwashing job. Um, I got the job, and um, in, the, in the spring, I was there. I was a big kid. I was fast. Um, I really love the job. You know, to this day, it's the best job I've ever had. I just felt like I was good at something for the first time. You know, he'd, he'd come with me. He did the first three shifts, all shift with me. He came in, rolled his sleeves up, put an apron on. He talked to me about the difference between a, a machine being loaded at 85% capacity and 115%. He said, they're both bad. One, dishes don't get clean. Two, we're just burning electricity and water. And he brought the bills out and showed me what was going on. He talked to me about uh, being a dishwasher was the most important position in the restaurant. He said, you watch, if you stop, everything stops, right? Now, when I got onto the floor, he also said being on the floor was the most important job, and, but they are, right? They're all, they're all important. He, um, 
I got my report card that year, and it was uh, the second year in a row they talked about holding me back from school. If you can't read, you know, at some point teachers have got to burst your bubble and, and hold you back. And um, I was washing dishes that day, and I, I was in tears, and he came in, and I turned my back. I didn't want him to see me crying. He was a very tough, a very macho uh, Greek man, this tall and super strong, like just all muscle. And he said, why are you crying? And I said, uh, I'm not. <laughs> and he said, tell me why you're crying. And I said, because I'm stupid. And uh, he said, no, you're not. He said, we all just have to learn how to learn. And he said, I'm going to teach you something. So stick around after work today. And after work that day, he made me work some more, and we did inventory that day. And he taught me, you know, I own a company now that does inventory all over the world because of him. He taught me the process, to break down the POS system, which was a cash register at the time, divide out the math on how much milk went into here and there, all into a very, uh, not a spreadsheet, an actual physical graph sheet, and we broke everything down. And over the course of the next three months, I learned to do inventory. Then when I finished that, he took me through the balance sheet, helped me understand how the balance sheet was. I was 14, now going on 15 years old. He took me through the P&L and helped me understand why this business makes money. He got a friend who owned a car dealership, and he showed me comparative P&Ls from different industries. Right? Mr. Panu died about 12 years ago. The town I grew up in had 1,800 people that lived there at the time. They estimated there was over 2,500 people at his funeral. The town had never seen anything like it before. Right? One guy in one little truck stop that had a little bar eventually attached to the side changed the lives of thousands of people. And that, that's all of our opportunity. Right? When we slow down and meet people where they are and then bring them along. And trust me, there's a great business uh, effect in that as well. Right? It's not just the right thing to do. It turns out to be really good for business. So I know this is very hard to see from where you are. So I'll just tell you what you're looking at here if it comes up. In all of my businesses, we use red, yellow, green reporting. Very simply, uh, red means holy fuck. Um, yellow means we're close, but we're not hitting our numbers. Green means we got it. And we also use super green, which I hire a lot of young people, and they're incentivized by something different, <laughs> and extra bonuses and everything else. So all we do here is we set up, um, let me show you when I put one in. This is, this is what Mr. Panu used to say to me all the time, that people respect what you inspect. Right? If, you don't, if you don't point things out, if you don't make it visual, they either don't think you care or they don't, they don't care themselves. So this will be easier to, to see from where you're sitting. Um, we use a tool that the Gallup industry came up with uh, called the Q12. It's 12 questions. Uh, they came up with it uh, right after the Second World War. And if you look on here, um, these three different bars are three different uh, Irish pubs in the small town that I live in. Um, remember what red is, like bad? Green's good and, and yellow something in between. So this is measuring the health of the business according to these 12. So of these, this, we'll call this A, B, and C. Which of these business is healthiest? Oh, we lost it. Which of these is healthiest? B, right? So when I sit with a new client and I put this in front of them, I say, tell me which of this business has the strongest culture, the healthiest business, and they say B. And I say, what about your six stores, or 25 stores, or 280 stores? Right? So in that moment, they realize they know more for certain about that business than they do their own. And you can produce those sort of reports in one day, right? Your staff don't put their name on the page. They just tick 12 boxes. And I can give you the simple uh, spreadsheet to just tabulate it all. And you put it up, and then you work on a couple of theorems. Screen reporting, we use it for everything because um, it just makes sense. And being dyslexic, I like things to be visual. And it turns out most people do, right? Most people don't like to eight-point font that you use and all the words on the page that no one ever reads. So we just put it up. It's nice and simple. If you wanted to do this, as I say, I'll give you this stuff if, if you'd like it. Um, you pick what you want to measure, and I'll give you 25 or 35 examples, and you can pick a few. You set clear benchmarks. I'll give you examples on cool ones to do. You assign people to each KPI. Someone has to, it has to matter to someone, and they have to be thinking about what to do about reds and yellows. And then you report weekly. Uh, the only thing I didn't mention here 
is that when we use these, you put in your success criteria, then you track it every week, or if it's a month at the end, if it's red or yellow, who's ever responsible just writes in what they're going to do about that. And that's all we tell you. Are you on target? How, how are you trending? And if you're not on target, what are you going to do about it? And if you are, high five and we move on. Right? We call them 10 and 2 reports. 10 minutes to create, 2 minutes to read. Right? I don't want to die in a meeting one day, and I nearly did. I used to, I used to be in like four hour meetings that had no purpose, and I realized I was getting old. Um, so my goal in this, coming from you know, a, a dishwashing background, and people used to come into my restaurants in Sydney and start with our company and say that, man, your dishwashers know more than the general managers at the place I used to work at. They all, everyone that worked for me, they're, they're, everyone that came in at a deal, we had two things. One, and this is the reason I attracted so many of these, these great young people to come and work for me. Number one is no dead end jobs, right? You want to start as a dishwasher? You got to be working towards the line, host stand, bar back, where are you going? So you had to have that path. And secondly, we had a three year plan for you in six month blocks. Yeah? And at the end of that, you had to write a business plan and present it to the team. And they say, what if I don't want to own a business? I say, do you ever plan to work for one? Yeah, then you need to know about business. Yeah? Every single person that worked for us will do that. All right, second idea for you guys today, and what I find and what I encourage a lot of uh, the folks that I coach to do is to really overinvest in onboarding. I find so many companies, well, this is an actual photo of an onboarding program, Bobby's competition, actually. We caught it, they just load you into a cannon and fire you out and say, here's your first shift. I'm just kidding, that's not an actual photo of... Anyways, but that's how I've felt, right? I've only had a couple of jobs in my life and it was like, hey, you know what you're doing, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, here's the keys and here's this and here's that and we're gonna open the doors in like eight minutes and here's your drawer and everything else and then Wham starts. I don't know if they're still playing Wham in the bars. I worked in the 80s. Um, and then you're off and you feel like an idiot, and customers feel like an idiot, and then we're in this awkward dance, and then three or six or nine months in, it really starts to click. I, I just think there's a better way, and it's, it's not, not a great way to, to treat people. So another thing that we did, I mentioned we had like a three-year kind of outcome, and, but we had a 90-day test drive. So if we hired someone, we'd say, listen, come on for 90 days, and you might not like it here, right? A lot of people didn't like it here. We weren't for everybody. Um, we might not like you. You might be really good at interviewing, but not really good at whatever we hired you to do. So we had a 90-day test drive. Um, we, I, I hate paperwork, as you're, you're probably gathering. So we had a very simple uh, passport that we had people. We said, listen, this is what's important here. There was about 15 things that you really had to know and then teach. I think these are six of the most powerful words in, in training and coaching other people. Firstly, watch me do it, right? Don't read about it. Maybe you've read about it, but now watch me. I'm gonna do it for you. I'm gonna demonstrate exactly how to do this. Ideally in a live environment. Second, I'm gonna move you out of that live environment and we're gonna sit down and be cool and slow down. Man, that was exhausting. And we're gonna talk about it and you can ask me anything. And in fact, you have to ask me at least three questions about it. You can't just say I'm cool. Right? Ask me about what we're doing, because we only got 15 things we're trying to show you, so it's really important, and if it doesn't fit, so ask me. Thirdly, show me. Rough. Role play if you can, and then let them do it out on the floor. And when folks did that, we had this passport, and we said, if there was in this business, and they're gonna show you three things each, and then you're gonna show them three things each, and when you got it, they're gonna sign off, so I know you know it. Right? And sometimes you're gonna have seven or eight days until you really uh, guest situation. And we hope there's none, none coming up, but there's probably going to be something that comes up. And you're gonna, we're going to talk about it, and then you're going to get a chance to go ahead and do that. Ask, what if, does anybody have a passport? What happens if you lose it? You get a new passport, right? What happens to all the stamps you got? No one goes and gets them for you. You start over again. Like nobody lost their passport, by the way. Nobody. Who wants to start over again? It's the only thing people don't lose is shit that they've got <laughs> to do something about. Um, Another thing that, that made a huge difference, and somebody that we hired, we actually hired our uh, assistant bank manager. Um, 
he came out and worked with us. He was incredible. Uh, hated working at the banks. Uh, loved working with us. And he said when he started the bank, they gave him a peer partner. Someone who worked with him kind of uh, one level up, was really invested in his, his development and so forth. Um, so we uh, borrowed that idea. And really quickly, and again, I can give you all this stuff, but this is a really simple schematic um, of like creating this passport, you know, the welcome, the history, mission, your culture and guests, how, you know, what are your guests like and that sort of thing. Then you get into these tracks here, host, server, bartender, and then you get into the more complex stuff over here. So this is like up to uh, six months, and then there's another block for the next six months or so, and makes it easy. You sign it off and you work your way through. Make sense? Yeah, and then you know where you're going if you work there. You know who's good at what. You're... Um, I also made a point of what I, what I think are teaching shit that's worth learning, right? Like, we didn't have in there, by the way, how to break down the dishwasher because people are going to show you how to break down the dishwasher, and no one reads how to break down the dishwasher. We had things in there like selling with dignity, right? So you want to move products that some people feel embarrassed to sell, and we show people the mechanics on how to sell with dignity. I think we all sell. Uh, body language 101, 201, 301. You know, what's the difference between someone who's three deep, who's anxious or frustrated, right? How do you pick up on those visual cues? Uh, diffusing angry humans was a popular one. A lot of people took this home and used it with uh, spouses or parents. Um, one of our managers, he was an amazing, uh, amazing guy from New Zealand. Um, he ran a lot of our pre-shifts. His pre-shifts would be a two-minute lesson woven in, and it'd be an eight-minute stretch. I don't mean full-on stretching, but he had these, all these different ways to stretch your body while you're standing there, instead of just standing around with your arms crossed. Or So there's a lot of cool stuff that you guys can do and, and share with people. And you became a full team member with us after six months. Uh, any farmers? Do a little piece on farming next? Just kidding. Oh, one farmer? All right, I'll meet you after. Um, this is, uh, I, I use this term literally because it's what all my guys that I coach are always saying, man, if I hear milk your cows one more time. I work with people that want to work on this crazy stuff. You know, Tuesday night we want to do this or Wednesday morning. I'm like, dude, you got to milk your cows, right? You have got to fucking make money. Our industry typically take 80% of your, your revenue during 20% of your hours of operation. So make sure that shit's tight then start to worry about other things. So I mentioned this earlier that I think if you don't, you know, if, you, if you're not looking, if you don't look to optimize your business every quarter and your staff don't have what they need, shit's broken, right? Like fix your business and get to work on the things that people need. Um, really simply, guys, I can give you a whole video course on this um, if you want it. Really simply here, this is all I'm talking about here. Like, this is your business. I've been to every one of your businesses. You're closed at some point. People in the hotel, I say, no, we're never closed. There's nobody there. Some humans come in, start milling around, saying you open. Yeah, get, starts to get really busy, and then suddenly hit the ceiling, right? Same thing happens for food as beverage, that at some point, even if I brought coach loads of people in behind, you can't serve anymore, right? That's your revenue cap. You're done. You're full. If you drive that up, this is how I used to buy businesses for a dollar, by the way. I'd look at the business and study it and say, if I can drive the revenue cap up 40, 50 percent, I can make that business work. Typically, you know, typically this is worth doing. Your prime time, depending on your type of business and your, your area, is between 12 and 16 hours a week is when it really matters. And if you can drive your revenue cap up by 10, 15, 20 percent, in most cases, you literally double profitability. If you can drive at 20, a lot of businesses double. Why is that? Why is just 20% more revenue so valuable? Not you, Costa. Anyone? Yeah. yeah. That's a Pareto principle, actually. What's that? The Pareto principle, 80-20. I can't hear him, Frank. That's a Pareto principle, 80-20. Yeah. Yeah. It works everywhere. You're right. In so if you, think, business. if you think about that, you're driving that extra revenue up. Unless you're in a shopping mall, your rent's not going up. All your fixed costs are staying the same, right? You got a 
22, 24, 28% cost of goods. A little bit more cost here and there, but you got 50, 60, 65% drop into the bottom line, right? It just starts raining money at that point. And your, your guests are happier. Who wants to be five deep when you could be three deep or two deep? Um, I won't bore you with all the math, but we're using uh, American dollars here. Easy to, uh, for me to wrap my head around. If you have a bartender producing $600 per hour, that's $10 per minute or 16 cents a second. So you think about optimizing that bar, right? I have to walk from here to there to get something that's now popular that wasn't popular before. 10 seconds there, $1.60 that I can't put in the register. 10 seconds back, $1.60. Right? So when we look, and the course I'll give you guys, if you want it, you'll do a few things. One, it walks you through how to identify your revenue cap. Yeah, as a collective, then it shows you how to break it down into different segments in your business. Secondly, it's got like a complete bar audit. You do it for yourself. You don't have to fly me or anybody else in. And you look at, you know, where are my opportunities to change? Now, really, really simply, if this was uh, one bar, um, the bar went all the way across here, and I had two bartenders on, and you look at a nine or 10 or 11 foot area, you want your bartenders ideally working inside most of the shift during peak hours, and just looking at when they cross over that line. You know, when do they move? What, what do they have to go down there for all the time? Or where do they get bottlenecked? Where do things really slow down? Obvious things like the POS, right? Some, some of our clients have moved the POS from the back of the bar to the front. It's more possible now than ever. Everything's got smaller. Some of the drawers are tight, they go underneath. Um, mirroring the bars up. They used to have one beautiful display, and now it made more sense, if, you know, if it makes sense for your business, to mirror those displays. The package I'll give you has about 40 or 50 different examples on things, and each one of those will only move things up half a percent, one percent, two and a half percent. But if all that equates to 10 percent, or 15 percent, or 20 percent, it's huge. Good question, or stretching? You're just waving? Um, so, who was Jacob was mentioning this group here? He, he said 212 group. It's 213. It's the LA uh, area code. Um, we did some work with them a few years back, and that's why Sed joined the group. Um, Sed said, "You know, we're not a corporate business. These guys, these guys are as anti-corporate as you're gonna gonna find." And he said, "I don't think something like that would work in my business. You know, I, I just you know we're doing pretty good." And they went through each division. Uh, I, won't, I won't play the video, but I can send you guys the video here. Um, this is a great guy. He's be become a friend. He was running their neighborhood uh, bars division. Uh, there's five or six bars in there. The lowest increase they saw was 8%. The highest was 38%. Just staggering. Just ran this process through all their businesses and got this amazing collective gain. So before I move on from that, there's three ways that it happens. One is looking at how the bartenders are working and, and what's wrapped around them. Second is looking at the, uh, at the product mix that you have. A lot of bars that I go into, the cocktails are designed by the top bartenders there, the top 10 or 20%. But of course, they've got to be executed by everybody. And this is where you see them failing and flailing behind the bar. Um, product mix, you know, I don't know who needs... Uh, 85 gins, unless you're a gin bar. Um, you know, maybe you do, I, I might be getting old. Um, so it works through each of these areas of your business and some things, cool, you'll get a win out of it and others, others won't be for you. That makes sense so far? Yeah? It makes more sense when you watch the videos that I'll give you. Last uh, piece, and then I'm gonna take some questions. Um, I mentioned you guys earlier uh, this is the uh, one of eight courses that I wrote uh, that's inside a business of bars that I'm turning into a book now. And this is, uh, this is how I started uh, my, my first uh, restaurant. This was effectively our, our original business plan. Um, there are uh, a few simple pieces to this. The philosophy is, is that if you want to put everyone on the same page, you literally have an opportunity to put everyone on the same page. Right? And to me, these are the things that matter most in any company that I own or any of the companies that I invest in. So, quite simply, if you can't answer the purpose, you know, why does this bar exist? Why does your city need that bar to exist? Who gives a shit? If you don't have an answer for that, 
I'm never going to invest there, and I certainly wouldn't work there, right? There's got to be a reason behind it, something that drives it, a purpose for getting started. Um, once I understand why something exists, I say, well, what do you do? How do you win out of this business? Tell me in like three steps, a couple of bullet, bullet points. If I work for you, what do we actually do? Then down here, we talk about how do you do it, right? What are the three steps to doing each of these three steps? Uh, over here, we have our core values. I'm going to show you guys a couple of the groups that we work with as an example. And then uh, what do people love that come in here, and what do they hate? So when I had eight bars, we did this for all eight bars. Uh, this stuff here stayed the same. This was dramatically different. Uh, I had a dive bar, I had a nightclub, I had a bottle shop, um, I had a restaurant. What customers loved at one was very different than what they loved at the other. So not only tell staff what they love, but show them how to do this. So some quick examples. One of our properties, you know, we really became known for cross-selling. So famous American products in Australia, but we started using local or Australian products and saying, hey, for the same money, or in some cases less money, I'd love for you to try this instead. Right? And people love that, right? It's a great value add. They go back to the table. They're drinking Australian now, right? So we told their staff they loved it and then showed them how to do that. Tailored experience, feeling like an insider. We were small and kind of cool, so we dripped through our story. And not just about me and starting it and the buildings, about the people that work there and the recipes that we used, all of that. We, we made sure that we, we dripped that through. Um, random acts of kindness. We always had a budget on a weekly basis to just do really cool things, fun things for people. Whether it was your birthday or not. I like celebrating people like when it was Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, service recovery. This might be different for me than for you, but if every member of your team cannot write down what exactly they should do when they fuck up, you are missing out. Because the person that they let down is going to punish you on the internet now. Thank God the internet wasn't like a big thing when I had restaurants, I would have never have slept. Um, so this is what we ask people to do, right? Step by step, and then we role played it, and then we showed them, and then we watched them do it, right? Might be different at your place, but whatever your steps are, Three would be great, I'm just not that good. 10 would be too many. It's hard to remember 10, 10 different things, especially if you're 20 years old and like the shit's hitting the fan. All right, so we made it, made it easy. Um, another client that we have, Jack McGarry at Dead Rabbit. Jack's taken all this stuff and kind of put it into playing cards. So he can go up to his staff and like kind of pick a card and then have a discussion with them and say, how do you do this? And then who do you work with that's amazing at that? And they go, oh, man, Sarah is unbelievable. Jack walks over to Sarah and says, hey, I was just talking to Mike, new guy, about X, and you were the example. Imagine how Sarah feels, right? See how you're just dripping it in. Training doesn't have to be three hours long on your day off, right? You might learn more out of that than, uh, that's Jack's passport. How cocky was Jack to name his company the best bar in the world, and then he won the best bar in the world. Thank God he won. He did have to change his name. Third best bar in the world. I don't know, it wouldn't sound very cool, would it? 84th. Um, we just finished, uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a geek, so we just finished this working on the design. So this is his uh, LMS system. I, I have seen LMS systems for businesses that have two and a half thousand stores. This is better. It's just so sticky. I don't care about how it looks. It's just really fucking sticky in how it works. And his goal is, if someone stays with him for a few years, it, it's going to be more valuable than a university degree. How cool is that? And you get paid along the way. All right. So we, I've saved some time for Q&A. Um, or kind of number one takeaway, if there's an idea you like, I could give you an idea on how to bring it to life or tell you an asset that I'll send you. Um, so the only rule here is just one at a time. Right? I know people love speaking into a microphone at a trade show. So I need that like I need crabs, right? Well, there's only one mic anyway. Yeah, so. one mic. And I've got it. So who's got a question for Mr. Finter, Sean Finter? You cannot tell me that nobody has a question. Aha, uh -huh. there's one. I'm coming. Got one there? Hello. Hello. Hey. Um, my name is Ronas. I come from a small country called Lithuania. And uh, every time I speak to great people like you, I'm always like very inspired. But oh. it seems that 
most of the things that you do apply to greater economies and greater countries like Australia, US or I don't know, bigger European countries. Coming from a small country and a young economy, I would say, uh, I kind of feel, you know, threatened by the things you're 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 saying in a sense that I'm not sure if it would apply uh, back back home. Okay. So, do you have like experience with younger economies and smaller countries, and do you think this applies generally to everyone? Or yeah, or? this guy in the front row flies to my office every hundred days from Bucharest. Cool. So, is there anything that you heard here that doesn't work in Bucharest? Yeah. I told him I'd find a way to get him a microphone and get him on stage. Right. He wore his best hat. Oh. All right, let's hear it. He's pumped. Uh, so, should I answer? Because uh, for me, it was the same when uh, these you know guys you approached get up me. Here. Yeah. Sorry, you know when you're Come on, on a fair good show. Photo on. You look, look, at this. Like, look at this guy. Yeah. yeah. So I had a talk with Jason. I said I said the same things you actually said. said this does not apply to Romania. You know, Bucharest is a emerging country, however they big companies call it. But actually, it's like we have the same issues. All the bar operators have the same issues all over the world. So and it felt like that and. Uh, to go there and chat with somebody from the, like, like Jack McGarry and you see that they have the same issues and they approach like uh, the same projects differently, that's amazing, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just a matter of scale, right? Like if you have a business that has eight staff, if you employ humans, they're messy, right? Uh, if you bring product in the back door and you sell it over the bar or on tables, all this works. There's, not, there's nothing here that doesn't and it's all business basics, right? And it doesn't just work for bars and restaurants. There's nothing I talked about today that doesn't work for every business. So I do, I do consulting for a little bit. I used to do more outside, but I, I love bars and there's a lot of them. So, uh, but I, I've done this sort of work with Fortune 100 companies, um, flower shops, uh, my uh, daughter's uh, friend's mother who has two employees in a little business. It, it all works. Yeah, just different scale. All right, other questions? Thank you. Uh, could you give some more um, specifics about uh, how to increase the revenue cap, please? Yeah, yeah. So, so the first thing you've got to know about it is what it actually is to begin with, right? Like, so here's... Uh, so, how many people in this room know for all of their properties exactly what the revenue cap is in peak hours in like a full configuration for food and beverage? Is there anyone in the room that like tracks that? Nobody. Bobby does? Yeah? Okay. So, think about it this way. It, well, if we had just one bar here, right, and, and it's Friday night, and let's say I'm a little neighborhood bar and, and I'm only really busy between uh, 9 p.m. and midnight. So I have three hours and I have two people working on this bar. If it was my bar, right behind this wall, there'd be a whiteboard. And it would say, um, it'd have the shift, and it'd say uh, food target and beverage target. And let's use that $600 per hour number. So we have this bartender in that configuration would be doing 1,800. This one would be doing 1,800 total for 3,600. And that'd be the goal, if that was the goal for the shift. And at the end of the shift, they would write down, the goal would be in black, and there'd only be two markers there. They would write with red if they fell short of the goal, or green if they exceeded the goal, on what happened that night. Now, I'm not saying that you know, more is always better, and there's really good reasons sometimes that you don't hit your revenue numbers, right? It was pouring rain, and people don't come as often when it rains. Uh, we had a big party, and instead of ordering lots of drinks, they had like one each. They just don't drink very much. There's a lot of reasons. So we'd write down underneath why. And not just when we win, but when we lose. And we'd drive, I, I promise you, it's, it's, um, it's called the Hawthorne effect, which states that anything that you focus on, give your attention to, will improve. Right? If you're focused on something and say, listen, this is important, because if you set up a bar, you might spend half a million dollars, you might spend five million dollars. It's all for 10 or 15 hours. And I think if we're not taking care of that 15 hours, now what happened with my bars was, we increased the collective capability by 50%, five zero, 
roughly over the course of about 18 months when we did this. Right, people just got better. Like if you go and play on a, on a football team with the guys at the, at the, in the park that are hung over and you're knocking the ball around, you're gonna get some exercise. If you go play with people that have just come out of playing at a high level and you play intensely with them for two hours every Sunday, you're gonna get really good at knocking the ball around. Right, so you measure it, I'll give you this package and it'll go through step by step those three key areas in how to drive it up and then I'll give you another thing. I'm going to give you everything I got because that's, that's the only reason I've come here. I don't have anything to sell, by the way. I just want to get these ideas out into the market. There's a, we call it a compass board. And I didn't put it up here because it would just look like a huge mess. But it's a great big board. It's like eight feet by four feet typically. And it has all your shifts broken down. Food, beverage, merch, if you have that, whatever it is. And you just start tracking your business. And for us, every year, we take the data. I've got a spreadsheet that'll throw it on to the next year on the same slots, but add 5% or 10%. If you set those goals and then you drive the business towards that, you'll increase each and every quarter until you cap the business out. Yeah, so I'll give you all of that. Five minutes, yes ma'am. Hi, thank you. Um, I come from a bit of a niche kind of restaurant. So we are working with products most people don't know. So they know the um, convenient, like the standard products like um, Campari or so. But because we are an organic restaurant, everything we use is 100% organic. So in the moment, we are struggling with the fact that a lot of people don't have the recognition value. So they don't come in and say, oh, I know that product. I want that product. So they're not ordering. So we have a target value, but very often we can't achieve that because people are not ordering an aperitive, a digestive, or a cocktail simply because of the fact they don't recognize the product. How shall we solve the situation? So, what, so just specifically at the end, I missed the last piece. What was the specific question? How can we solve that we can reach the target when we have products people don't recognize yeah. because they don't recognize the names? They recognize yeah. Campari, but they will not recognize the similar product in the bio, like the organic market. Yeah. So, you know, it's, the way I look at that is I don't think it's a, a, a product problem, it's an education problem, right? When I, when I went to raise money, I only did that once, and I, and I can do without investors for the rest of my life. But when I went to raise money, the guy who was leading the, the charge said, I can't speak to Sean's acumen as a restaurateur, but he's a world-class educator, right? I was able to make things sticky, that not only the staff, but for the guests coming in, right? So if you look at how to design that schematic and say, listen, the, the end, end goal is to, to not only um, bring awareness, but to bring passion to these products, to make people stand up for them and, and, and be truly engaged in that, you know, that, that's an incredible thing, but that's a very different design than I'm guessing that you have today. And if you look at that and reverse engineer it and say, how do I get one of our customers to walk out of here and get on the bus, or better, in two weeks from now, over the water cooler at work, tell this part of the story, right? If you design from that perspective, really cool things happen. Yeah? I think we have time for a couple more questions. This side of the room's been quiet. Don't think we haven't noticed. Anyone have any questions? Is everyone clear with what a revenue cap means? Maybe you could just quickly explain what that yeah. is. Yeah, so revenue cap means that your business takes revenue all the time, and at some point it hits a cap. It, it can't take any more, no matter how many more people that we push in. And so it's really easy, you know, kitchens have been really focused on this for a couple hundred years, right? Like there's a little window and food gets pushed out of it. You, you want to learn about efficiency and optimizing? Go talk to your chefs. Right? These people understand every inch in the value of your leg not crossing this line and rubbing up against my hairy wet leg. You know what I mean? They, they figure things out all for one goal. Get food out that little hole faster. Bars are just lagging behind. It's the same thing on a bar. And say, listen, how, you know, the, the difference is, is that no one's screaming. Like when the food's not out, the staff are there and say, hey, this guy ordered this 42 minutes ago. You know, when the bar is five deep, you know, yeah, people aren't happy, but there's not the same focus and pressure. If you take that and say, listen, we typically only do $3,600 in this slot or $10,000 for the day. If I was coaching your business and you do 10,000 collectively on a Friday, I'd say, well, how do, you do, how do you do 12? What would it take to do 12? And you'd go, well, you know, uh, well, 
this would have to happen and that would have to happen. You know the best people to ask how to do 12? Your bartenders, they'll tell you. Say, hey, dude, we've been trying to tell you for a year. We need this and this, and if you only did this differently, uh, we'd be a lot more efficient business. I'm glad you're listening now. That's what they'll say. And then you study it, and when they see you trying to make things better for a mutual benefit, right? Because in most countries, I know not everyone gets gratuities and, and tips, but in most countries, there's a benefit. Doing more during those hours is a benefit for not only the, the business owner, but for the, for the bartender or server or bar back. And you've really got to promote that, that mutual benefit. And if you do, really special things start to happen in business. Guys, I'm just about out of time. I'm going to mention, oh, one more question, OK. Oh, thank god, I thought it was Angus. No, it's just me. That guy's a ball breaker. <laughs> oh, Bobby Hugo, Jesus, even worse than Angus. Uh, my question was, I think that a lot of people, when they're approaching that revenue cap issue in the industry right now, they're choosing to address that through pricing. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, that's the strategy. And if, just watching cocktail prices globally over the last five years in particular, I think we've seen people try and flirt with what that cap is yeah. and try and get as close to it as possible. I was wondering if you had just had any thoughts on what's happening with pricing and if people are overemphasizing that or just, just general thoughts on pricing with cocktails in, in general. Yeah, well, so th there's two, two aspects to consider with that. Um, one is on, you know, I, I find today more than ever that uh, retailers are exposed with their pricing, right? Again, I'm glad the internet wasn't a factor because you have bargain hunters that can go online and see, you know, what's happening where and so forth. So, you know, I think we all know that, you know, the best bars in, in your area are doing huge volume and, and have fair prices, right? Customers aren't stupid. They, they, they come in, they want value for money, and I'd rather make my money in, you know, 18 peak hours and a lot of businesses that are pushing into 12 because you know, they're charging a premium and they're not getting there. But on figuring out that revenue cap, Bobby, what I'd what I suggest, this is what we did at all our business. We would, we would do uh, three peak shifts, three different teams, and say, let's see who can set the marker for this shift here, right? Because it really depends. And, and barbacks have as much to do with it as bartenders sometimes. So you kind of put together a dream team to set. When we're doing those, we would dedicate a supervisor for the entire three hour block to say, listen, we will call quits on this if we see anybody compromise service for speed, right? This isn't a race, and, you know, but we want you to work your fastest and best. We put together teams that would do $3,000 um, an hour or, or what do you say, say $5,000 in a block, and another team that looked equally as good on paper that would only do $4,000. So we try to figure out the true opportunity cost inside of that. And then pricing's relative, right? The price goes up for one, it goes up for all. Yeah. So, guys, I'm going to turn it back to Frankie. I'm on the, uh, I don't even know where this other stage is. Is that Diageo World somewhere? Uh, I'm going over there. We'll find uh, out. Yeah, somewhere else. It's somewhere else. And then here's uh, my details. I mentioned a lot of stuff. I, it'll, it'll take a little while. My team will get back. They intercept these emails. I put all these things in up top because I don't have any of these. Actually, I have Facebook now. Uh, but this works. And that's my Facebook. And that's actually my number. Um, so guys, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. I'm really keen to give you everything I talked about today and more and help uh, anybody that I can. So I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean Finter. Thank you. That was really wonderful. I think everybody, I saw a lot of people taking notes. Everybody learned a